Okay, we start the next part of our journey um, as black body radiation. Um, so we already have done a lot of this in astrophysics because what we're about to do today is Vines Law or what Wings Law, whatever you want to pronounce it, depending on which part of America you come from. Um, and it's a way we determine the temperature of a star. So this black body radiation was a phenomena that was discovered back in the 1800s and it was a bit of confusion. People didn't know really what it was all about and how to explain it. So let's just remind ourselves what a black body is. And I think I have to do that one. That's it. Right. So, um, just to put ourselves in context, what time of the, um, of the, uh, the centuries we are in, we're at the end of the 19th century and we have just allowed Maxwell to, uh, so let's just start with Faraday first. Faraday, as you know, Michael Faraday had just done the electromagnetic law of induction and earlier in that century, in the 1930s, he had done the motor effect. So there was a way of somehow linking electro, electric, electricity, that's what I'm saying, electricity and magnetism, and we were trying to work out what that link was. But the only person who could do this was Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell. And he predicted that there would be electromagnetic waves, he didn't call them that at that stage, these were the types of light waves, like light, that would be all of different frequencies and wavelengths. And last lesson we had a look at Hertz, and Hertz had discovered one of these, and we now call it radio waves. He called it, well, they called it Hertzian waves for a while after him, especially after his death. So James Clark is the guru in the late 1800s talking about electromagnetic waves. So his equations form all of, our, of the understanding of what X-rays, gamma rays, light waves, ultraviolet, all those would do. The biggest thing about it was the speed of light had now been determined. It was predicted that there would be this speed of light, of course, um, we know as C, and it should not vary depending upon which frame of reference. Okay. However, there was a problem. Not everything that he predicted was going to come about because his, his, his observations and his theories were all based on mathematical models. And one of these was called the black body radiation problem. So what is a black body? A black body is any object, object that absorbs all incoming radiation. So here is the um, definition of a black body. So what are black bodies? A sun is a black body. Now, we think about the sun as not being black, but imagine what colour would the sun be if it didn't radiate its own, in, um, own light? If we were just to take the sun and cool it down, what colour would it be? It would be black. It would be not emitting light, it would be a perfect black sphere in space. Now, black objects, as you know, now most of you are wearing a black scarf. Why are we wear, why in this winter do we wear darker clothes? They right, they absorb more frequencies of light. Remembering the reason why an object is black is, or oh, let's start with why something looks white. White means it's reflecting all the light off it back into your eyes. So from the fluorescent lights above us, we see, um, we see white light. So that contains red, green, blue, yellow, all the entire spectrum. It comes down, hits my shirt, and then bounces into your eyes. The colours that reflect into your eyes is what you see as the colour. So if we see white, we see all the colours of the rainbow reflected at once. And so we see white. But if I see blue, so I see this blazer here as blue, what has happened is all the light coming down onto Cindy's blazer has most of it has been absorbed. The only colour that has been reflected is what colour? Blue. In fact, it's actually not just blue, it's a, a whole combination of other colours, but the main colour is blue. Okay? 
So black bodies or black colours absorb nearly every colour that lies on it. But it's not just going to be colour that is absorbed, it's every part, possible type of radiation as well. So it's just not colour, it's ultraviolet light, it's gamma rays and so on. So a black body is any object that absorbs all incoming radiation when it is cold. So some things do not look like a black body, but are black bodies. The sun, for instance. Would the earth be a black body? Yes. Does the earth actually, um, you know, if we take away the sun, what colour would the earth be? Black, wouldn't it? The only reason why we see some colour on the earth is because the sun illuminates it. We take the sun away, we're just a, a hump, of, you know, just a sphere in space. No light, nothing. Okay. Yes, it's pretty depressing. So then what things aren't black bodies? Are there things that aren't black bodies? Um, yeah, there's not many. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this is what the experimenters were doing. Now, after um, fiddling around with foundry balls back in the 1800s, a foundry ball is just a big cannonball, and these were used to be melted down for pig iron and so on. Now, imagine, I'll just turn the lights off so you get a bit clearer on this one, um, this here is a um, is just a big metal ball, okay, a big cannonball, and it's going to be hollow on the inside, and we're going to put a hole through the centre. Okay, so we've got a sphere, we've made it hollow, so it's a metal sphere, hollow, and have a hole that we can look into. Okay, now if we look into here, and we just you, know, you just made this ball, what would you see inside? Nothing. Nothing. It's black inside, isn't it? It's like peeking through the keyhole of a room which is entirely in darkness. You don't see anything. Okay? So, what do we suddenly do? I'll just get across over here. When you say suddenly, do we? Come on. That. Yeah, right here. So, I'll go with that colour. Right, so it's not a pattern, no. Okay, I haven't hollowed it out, but it doesn't have to be hollow. I'm just going to look into this here. What would I see inside that hollow? Black, wouldn't it? Now, what we do is we now put a Bunsen burner or some other form of flame underneath there. What it's going to do is it's going to start heating up the ball, the metal. Okay? And what will start happening is, very soon, you will start seeing inside there a dull, bricky red glow. Why? Because when you heat metal up, what do you see? It firstly glows what colour? Brown. Bra yeah, that brown and red, then it goes red. We know, we know this se sequence of colours very specifically because of our stars. And we've studied a lot of star stuff. So it firstly glows red, wrong colour, that's orange. <laughs> Not gonna. Okay. So firstly it goes red, then it glows orange. <sighs> you got the idea, okay? Orange, then yellow. Yellow. <laughs> yellow. Then does it glow green? No. 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 What's the next colour it glows after that? Yellow, Yellow white. Okay. And then? White. White. Okay. And then eventually it will glow? Light blue. And then bright blue. Okay. Okay. What? Is happening is as we heat this up, we start seeing different colours inside the foundry ball. And the question was, why? Why do we do this? And this um, radiation that came out was called black body radiation. Okay? We weren't looking at the outside, we were looking at the inside radiation. So we were assured that if we looked into this hole, 
here, that it wasn't any other light that was coming from anywhere outside, that this light in the centre must be coming from something happening to the ball itself. It was not something else coming from outside shining on it. Are we okay with that? So going back to the and uh, okay, going back to this one here. Um, there is the diagram here, but this over here is a black body radiator. Inside, we just couldn't have the ball sitting there um, on a bench. It would just simply burn through the bench. So they had these big, like, safe type things, and they had electric heaters. At this stage, we had electric, uh, electricity and so on, heating up the ball. And from this little nosy type thing just here, that was when you, you, you pulled up, um, that hat off and you can look into the, the foundry wall inside the black body lake inside. Are we okay? Now we can take the um, spectrum of all of these light that came out. So the detected radiation over here, we can send through a spectrometer and we know what spectrometers do. They measure the intensity and the brightness and the, and the, the black lines and so on of the fixed, uh, of the spectrum. Okay. So what was the um, suggested solution to this problem? So they said that in a hot substance, atoms and electrons are rapidly vibrating. Okay, we know that. This is called kinetic particle theory. Okay. These vibrations will cause, um, will generate an oscillating electric field, and oh, that means an oscillating magnetic field. If oscillating electric fields create oscillating magnetic fields, then you will get electromagnetic waves. Okay. So to summarise what that says. So what is happening as we heat it up, we're going to just have a look at one atom right in the middle. So this is our atom. And we know from year seven and eight that if I add heat, to my atom, what happens to my atom's movement? Right, it moves backwards and forwards. It vibrates in all different directions. Okay? And you know at the moment you're doing an assignment about metals and lattices and so on. We know that these atoms are arranged in a crystal form and they start to jiggle more backwards and forwards and these bonds that hold them together start to stretch. And what is inside these bonds holding them together? Electrons. So we've got positive ions jiggling backwards and forwards, and we have negative electrons jiggling backwards and forwards. As an electron or positive, or any charge, it doesn't matter, if a charge moves backwards and forwards, that means we have a changing electric field. because we are moving a charge in space. Therefore, in the region around this charge, whether it be positive or negative, we have a changing electric field. So in this region of space, E is changing. Okay? Now, we also know from Faraday's understanding that if you have a changing electric field, we must also therefore have a changing what other field? magnetic field. So if I change my um, electric field, then it will generate generate a changing magnetic field. Okay. But a changing magnetic field will also create a changing Electric field. And this would constantly go out and they would be mutually inducing each other. So as this disturbance, this changing electric field went out into space in all directions, it would start generating a changing magnetic and electric field simultaneously. And this is what we know as 
an electromagnetic wave. An electromagnetic wave is a wave that has a changing electric field in one direction, which induces a changing magnetic field in a perpendicular direction. This is very hard to draw. So I hope that you know. At right angles. So if the sine wave is in the vertical position, going up and down, if you look at me at this moment, it might make sense. If the sine wave is going up and down like that, the magnetic field goes in and out like this, at right angles to it. Okay? So these two fields change each other. Which is inducing which? Is it the electromagnetic field which is inducing the magnetic field? Or is it the magnetic field inducing the electric field? According to relativity, it doesn't matter which is which. Equally. And they're both equally valid. They're simultaneously generating each other. Okay? So this is what um, Maxwell described as an electromagnetic wave. And that's the reason why it is called that ter um, terminology altogether. It's an electro. The electro mean standing for the electric field. Magnetic standing for the magnetic field, and wave the disturbance as it goes out in all directions. Okay? So what is happening as the black body radiation goes in? We go back to our atom. Our atom starts to jiggle. Okay, vibrates backwards and forwards. As it jiggles, what is automatically changing? The electric field. And in all directions around it, going out, in so in all directions a wave is spread out and this is the EM wave. Okay? It's like dropping a pebble into a pond of water and the wave goes out as concentric circles in all directions. Are we okay with that? Now the more you jiggle the faster the the um, crests between the waves. So let's have a look at this. Here's atom number one. Okay, atom number one is going to jiggle slowly, slow jiggle, and therefore it's going to have first wave there, second wave here, third wave here. That's a slow wave. Can you get the idea? Yeah. The distances between the peaks is the wave length. Because okay? if you go up and down, just imagine yourself in a, in a very still pool in the middle of a, a swimming pool, and you start to jiggle up and down, you can make waves, slow waves. Now, take atom number two. You again in a slow pool, okay? And you jiggle yourself up and down in a fast. Okay. So what's going to happen is the waves are going to be much closer together, the wave fronts. Okay? So the wave length is much shorter. The speed of the wave, of course, is set by the medium. If you're in water, water waves always travel at the same speed. You can't make them travel any faster or slower. Apart, um, the only way you can make that change is the depth. So if you're in a constant pool of water, Water waves will always travel the same speed. But if you change the wavelength, what are you changing about the frequency? This has high frequency and a short wavelength. This one here has a higher wavelength and a low frequency. So you can set your frequency by jiggling faster. If you jiggle faster, you will be giving off a higher frequency wave. So let's have a look at our EM spectrum again. And we're going to talk about frequency here. What's the lowest frequency waves on our EM spectrum? Radio. What's the high wave? Gamma. Okay. And right in the middle, we have visible light. So if we jiggle our atoms backwards and forwards slowly, the atom will release what type of wave? A radio wave. 
If we jiggle our atoms and electrons backwards and forwards at a faster speed, what will we be releasing? Higher frequencies. So let's just say we did this one's higher, and it might be a visible light, for instance. Okay? It depends on how fast we have to jiggle our atoms. Okay? If we jiggle backwards and forwards, one per second, it will definitely radiate away. The frequency of um, a visible light is in the terabytes, so it's thousands of times per second. Hundreds of thousands, in fact, thousands of thousands of times per second. Okay? So we've got to make these jiggles quite fast to get a higher, higher frequency. Are we okay with that? So this is the explanation that Maxwell comes up with for explaining black body radiation based on basically year seven science, isn't it? It's what you were taught in year seven. What theory underpins the whole lot? The kinetic theory of matter. The faster we jiggle, the faster, the higher the frequency. Okay? And so we've got, um, going back to this one here, that a hot substance, atoms and electrons are vibrating rapidly. These vibrations will just generate electromagnetic waves, oscillating fields and magnetic fields. And all objects at a temperature greater than zero Kelvin, that's above absolute zero, named after Lord Kelvin, will have their atoms jiggling. Because at zero, Lord Kelvin said atoms stop jiggling. That is why it was called absolute zero, absolute no movement. We're about 270 degrees above absolute zero, your body temperature. And so for your atoms are quite happily jiggling backwards and forwards. Uh, would you be generating electromagnetic waves? Yes, you are actually generating radio waves. In fact, you're generating a radio wave, or actually an infrared wave, and if I walk this way, and I look at that detector over there, that's a infrared radiation detector, oh, yeah. it yeah. would detect, <laughs> it detects my actual infrared radiation. Okay, if you walk fast, it doesn't matter, it's detecting that there is an approaching of the, um, infrared radiation towards it. Because I am, I am generating heat. I'm losing heat and radiating heat to the atmosphere. Okay? So all of us are radiators. Okay? We're not all black body radiators because, remember, a black body radiator is not just something just radiating something out. It is also absorbing everything that's falling on. Thank God I'm not because I'll be just getting so, so hot. I actually reflect some of my light. Okay? Because I'm quite pale. And if I was black coloured, oh. <laughs> <laughs> if I was uh, black coloured, sorry, it's um, if I was uh, if I was a total utter black, in other words, a black hole, you wouldn't even be able to see my features because I would not be reflecting anything. Can you see the features of a black star? Yeah. yeah so some light must be reflecting off that. Off that. A black radiator, you'd look at it and you could not even make out the set of the surface. The surface would be so black so dark that you couldn't even see the surface. The surface would just be sapping all the light around it. Okay. And we use this idea to determine the temperature of stars. And these are Vines curves, aren't they? Now, a Vines curve, or a radiation intensity curve, is um, we have on the bottom here the wavelength, along here, and on the vertical, as we know, is the intensity. And the peak of the, of, the, um, of the curve can be used to determine the actual temperature that the black body has been heated up to. And we've been using this in uh, our astrophysics to determine the temperature of stars, which are miles, thousands of kilometers away. So not thousands, but light years away. Okay, so billions and billions. Okay? And we know that the formula for this, I'll just go further forward, is that one there. That the peak intensity of wavelengths, quoted by Wien's law, Wien's law, Wien's law, is given by that. It's lambda max, the peak uh, wavelength, 
is equal to 2.9 by 10 to the minus 3 over the temperature in Kelvin. Okay? Because it is space. Okay? And going back, we have done, um, Vine and all of his friends did a hell of a lot of work plotting temperatures of every um, possible temperature of the um, black body radiator. So here is a whole set of black body radiators put um, one after the other behind each other. So what is the feature of all these curves? The first thing is we know, notice that down on the radio end it tapers down slowly. Okay? So that's the first feature. So the first feature is at the radio end and I'm going to put the radio down here because it's got to be the same as that one there. Okay. This is lambda, so it's wavelengths. So this is long wavelengths. So this is large numbers. The peak tapers down. Okay. Then on the other end, what we call the ultraviolet end, the UV end, okay, or the higher frequency end, um, these are short wavelengths, the curve rapidly comes to zero. It doesn't just simply, you know, taper down nice and slowly, it actually plummets. Now this vertical axis is intensity, okay, and that's arbitrary units, you can measure intensity in terms of larks, lumens, and all these other things, um, it doesn't, you don't care, okay. And we know that as you heat an object up, what happens to this curve? So, this, these three curves, if you are in a low temperature, it looks like this. Higher temperature, but I'll do that one. Oops, still bad. Uh, better. And really high temperature. Okay. What happens to the two? Well, the two changes to the radiation intensity curves. Remember, this is lambda on this and intensity on the vertical. What are the two changes? Right, the peak moves, this peak moves sideways. Okay? So that's the first thing. The peak moves closer and closer to the UV end. Secondly, the height of the curve increases. Now, the area under that curve, we know you've met this in calculus now, the area under the curve is the summation of all the energy released. In other words, it is a measure of the brightness of the curve. Which of these three would be glowing the most? This one, the third one. This one here glows the so, so much because it's so bright. The area under that curve tells you how much light is or radiation is actually being released. <coughs> this one here is the coolest and we know that it's not radiating much light or anything at all. Remember, do all of these have to be to do with light? No. no. So let's just look, put on each of these curves. Where is the red and the blue end? Now, blue and red would be there. Okay, that's the visible light. Here would be red and blue. Okay. I'll just put some green in this one. Okay. Green there as well. And here is red and blue. 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 That's it. And red. Red. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. This one here, this one up here, is radiating mostly only a small amount of visible light, but what else is it radiating? A lot of large amount of infrared. And radio and microwave. So this one here, you'll be able to see a small, dull glow. 
but you'll be able to pick up it well on a radio receiver or so on. The middle one here is starting to put out quite a significant amount of visible light. And it would be the different combinations of the three colours, the red, the blue, and the green, that will mix in different proportions to give the three, the, the actual colours that we know, which starts at the top colour is, the first colour, this one here will probably be bricky red. There we go, it's red, orange, yellow, white, and then blues. Okay, you know there's a yellow, white, and a blue white in there as well. Um, that's blue. Anyway. Okay, depending on how tall these three are in relation to each other, will be the colour combination, like mixing paint. So a blue, a bright blue one, would be looking like this. A lot of that. A little bit of that and not too much of that. That would be a bright blue star or blue object. Okay? And you, you can work it out from that. So um, that's how the colour would be determined. And we know that the temperature can be determined by using Vine's law saying that lambda max is equal to Vine's constant over T. And Vine's constant is just written down as 2.9 by 10 to the minus 3. Okay, are we okay with this? Okay, so going back to that diagram we just had a few moments ago, this is what Vine and his cohort, not just Vine, um, other people were, were trying to do all this. Um, so this was, remember it was a puzzle, we were trying to solve it and, and modify our theories to be as accurate as possible. So these are a series of Vines radiation curves, one after another. What's the overview between this curve and the curve behind it? It's, it's higher and to, towards the, X, um, the high end. What does that mean? It means that the second curve behind would be heated to a hotter temperature, wouldn't it? And hotter and hotter and hotter again. Okay. Now, if you joined all the peaks together, they start to form this line up here. Okay? Very important. It would start to, I'll just see if I can get it. Uh, that one? Yeah. It would, if you join the peaks together, the curve would start to go up like that. Okay? And that means that if you started heating an object up, what would happen is the curve would climb higher and higher and higher, giving off more energy than you were heating it up for. And this is going to be a problem because we can work out the amount of energy that has been radiated by summing under the curve. That area there indicates how much energy has been radiated. But the, the actual, when you do the mathematics, you realise that this starts to approach infinity. It's starting to approach infinity now. And so we get this problem coming up. Maxwell's equations predicted that the curve would not firstly go down in this end out. Whoops. Go back, sorry. We know from experiment that it tapers along here and it dies down that end. It dives. Okay? Maxwell's equation said that's not the shape you should get. Firstly, the, it should just go up. Our Vines radiation curve, one end should not dip down to the bottom. Secondly, if you join all the um, peaks together, Maxwell's equation says that you should start getting the peaks to join up and become like that. And what does that look like? What type of curve is that? It's a hyperbola, isn't it? Okay. And hyperbola's approach? Infinity. So as you heat something up, the wavelength will go towards that end, but the amount of energy will start to become infinite that you generate from the radiation. So what's, what's the problem? Maxwell's equations are not 
accurate. And we will be breaking the law of conservation of energy. So this was, now remember we're talking about the 1800s, so you know, it was splashed across the front page of the newspapers, calling it the ultraviolet catastrophe. <laughs> Why? Because in the ultraviolet end, down this end over here, these things did not conform to Maxwell's equation. And we couldn't explain it. Maxwell's prediction says that it should just keep on going up. But experiment said, no, it doesn't. Scientists tried to create, to get Maxwell's um, equations to match the experimental data. But the experimental data was not correct. Exper well, sorry, experimental data is correct. So Maxwell's equations must somehow not work for higher frequencies. They work perfectly okay for this end. This end was brilliant. But after the peak max, we had a problem. Maxwell's equations start to predict going up infinitely, whereas we know that the shape of all of these things, all of these things looks like that. That they all then dive down towards them. And nothing goes higher than midway through the x-ray. Nearly everything dives straight down into UV. You cannot heat a black body up and get gamma radiation. You can heat a black body up and just get a very small amount of x-rays. The, this, by the way, is the first part of x-rays. The real dangerous x-rays come up this end up here. Okay. So we have a problem. And the theory predicted that most of the waves emitted from a hot object would be above the peak maximum. They were not there. The gamma, X and ultraviolet portions of the graph were not present. So experiment and um, theory, remember theory in this case was, remember the whole point of the theory is to explain all the things. The theory now has to change. The theory has to be modified. We don't reject it all. We only have to reject the part that does not match with the experimental data. So Maxwell, something, something has to happen. Okay? And we're going to come up next lesson and talk about Planck's solution to that problem. Okay? And I'll generate that, uh, go through that at this, at this point. So we'll stop there.